Hi. Um, since uh, it's already uh, two minutes past the starting time, I'm just going to start. So I'm Charles Louis. Um, I'm, uh, yeah, I've been yeah, working in the agile space for, uh, for a while. And I uh, recently noticed that uh, stories, fairy tales, and so on, that actually they're quite powerful. And uh, we can learn a lot from them. So this is why I brought this with me. Uh, it's the story that from Hans Christian Andersen. Um, well, the workshop is called The Emperor's New Clothes, so I'm going to read the story of The Emperor's New Clothes, and then we're going to work with it. Okay, I'll read this way. So I uh, would encourage you to really sit back. Uh, you can keep your eyes closed or half open, or just, just imagine when you were a child and you were listening to stories. Um, and uh, enjoy the moment. And also, um, be aware of how the story moves you, okay, so because you'll need that later. Okay. So, the Emperor's New Clothes. Many, many years ago, lived an emperor who thought so much of new clothes that he spent all his money in order to obtain them. His only ambition was to be always well-dressed. He did not care for soldiers, and the theatre did not amuse him. The only thing, in fact, he thought anything of was to drive out and show a new suit of clothes. He had a coat for every hour of the day, and as one would say of the king, he is in his cabinet. So one could say of him, the emperor is in his dressing room. The great city where he resided was very gay. Every day, many strangers from all parts of the globe arrived. One day, two swindlers came to his city. They made people believe that they were weavers and declared they could manufacture the finest cloth to be imagined. Their colors and patterns, they said, were not only exceptionally beautiful, but the clothes made of their material possessed the wonderful quality of being invisible to any man who was unfit for, po for purpose or unpardonably stupid. That was the wonderful cloth, thought the emperor. If I were to be dressed in a suit made of this cloth, I should be able to find out which men in my empire were unfit for purpose, and I could distinguish the clever from the stupid. I must have this cloth woven for me without delay. And he gave a large sum of money to the swindlers in advance that they should set to work without any loss of time. They set up two looms and pretended to be very hard at work, but they did nothing, whatever on the looms. They asked for the finest silk and the most precious gold cloth, all they got they did away with, and worked at the empty loom till late at night. I should very much like to know how they are getting on with the cloth, thought the emperor. But he felt rather uneasy when he remembered that he who was not fit for his office could not see it. Personally, he was of opinion that he had nothing to fear. Yet he thought it advisable to send somebody else uh, first to see how matters stood. Everybody in the town knew what a remarkable quality the stuff possessed, and all were anxious to see how bad or stupid their neighbors were. I shall send my honest old minister to the weavers, he thought, uh, thought the emperor. He can judge best how stuff works, for he is intelligent, and nobody understands his office better than he. The good old minister went into the room where the swindlers sat before the empty loom. Heaven preserve us, he thought, and opened his eyes wide. I cannot see anything at all, but he did not say so. Both swindlers requested him to come here and ask him if he did not admire the exquisite pattern and the beautiful colours pointing to the empty looms. The poor minister tried his very best, but he could see nothing, for there was nothing to be seen. Oh dear, he thought, can I be so stupid? Should, I should never have thought so, and nobody must know it. Is it possible that I am not fit for my office? No, no, I cannot say that I was unable to see the cloth. Now, have you got nothing to say? said one of the swindlers, while he pretended to be busily weaving. Oh, it is very pretty, exceedingly beautiful, replied the old minister, looking through his glasses. What a beautiful pattern! What brilliant colours! I shall tell the emperor that I like the cloth very much. 
We are pleased to hear that, said the two weavers, and described to him the colors and explained the curious patterns. The old minister listened attentively that he might relate to the emperor what they said, and so he did. Now the swindlers asked for more money and silk and gold cloth, which they required for weaving. They kept everything for themselves, and not a thread came near the loom, but they continued as Hippoto to work at the empty looms. Soon afterwards, the emperor sent another honest courtier to the weavers to see how they were getting on, and if the cloth was nearly finished. Like the old minister, he looked and looked, but could not see, could see nothing, as there was nothing to be seen. Is it not a beautiful piece of cloth? asked the two swindlers, showing and explaining the magnificent pattern, which, however, did not exist. I'm not stupid, said the man. It is therefore a good appointment for which I am not fit. It is very strange, but I must not let anyone know it. And he praised the cloth which he did not see, and expressed his joy at the beautiful colours and the fine pattern. It is very excellent, he said to the emperor. Everybody in the whole town talked about the precious cloth. At last, the emperor wished to see it for himself. While he was still on blue, with a number of courtiers, including the two who had already been there, he went to the two clever swindlers who now worked as hard as they could, but without using any thread. Is it not magnificent? said the two old statesmen who had been there before. Your Majesty must smile the colours and the pattern. And then they pointed to the empty looms, for they imagined the others could see the cloth. What is this? thought the emperor. I do not see anything at all. That is terrible. Am I stupid? Am I unfit to the emperor? That would indeed be the most dreadful thing that could happen to me. Really, he said, turning to the weavers, your cloth has our most gracious approval. And nodding contentedly, he looked at the empty loom, for he did not like to say he saw nothing. All his attendants who were with him looked and looked, and although they could not see anything more than the others, they said by the emperor, it is very beautiful. And all advised him to wear the new magnificent clothes at the great procession which was soon to, be take, to take place. It is magnificent, beautiful, excellent, one heard them say. Everybody seemed to be delighted. And the emperor appointed the two swindlers imperial court weavers. The whole night, previous to the day on which the procession was to take place, the swindlers pretended to work and burned more than 16 candles. People should see they were very busy to finish the emperor's new suit. They pretended to take the cloth from the loom and worked about in the air with big scissors and sewed with needles without tread and said at last, the emperor's new suit is ready now. The emperor and all his barons came to the hall. The swindlers held their arms as if they had something in their hands and said, these are the trousers, this is the coat, here's the cloak, and so on. They are all as light as a cobweb, and one must feel as one had nothing at all upon the body, but that is just the beauty of them. Indeed, said all of the courtiers, but they could not see anything, for there was nothing to be seen. Does it please your majesty now to graciously undress, said the swimmers, that we may assist your majesty in putting on the new suit before the large looking glass? The emperor undressed and the swindlers pretended to put the new suit upon him, one piece after the other, and the emperor looked at himself in a glass from every side. How well they look! How well they fit! said all. What a beautiful pattern! What fine colours! That is a magnificent suit of clothes. The master of the ceremonies announced that the bearers of the canopy, which was to be carried in the procession, were ready. I am ready, said the emperor. Does not my suit fit me marvelously? Then he turned once more to, to the looking glass that people should think he admired his garments. The chamberlains who were to carry the train stretched their hands to the ground as if they lifted up a train and pretended to hold something in their hands. They did not like people to know that they could not see anything. The emperor marched in the procession under the beautiful canopy, and all who saw him in the street and out of the window whispered, and all who watched him in the streets and out of the windows exclaimed, 
Indeed, the emperor's new clothes are incomparable. What a long train he has, how well it fits him. Nobody wished to let others know that they saw nothing. For them, they would have been unfit for their office or too stupid. Never an emperor's clothes were more admired. But he has nothing on at all, said the little child at last. Good heavens, listen to the voice of an innocent child, said the father. And one whispered to the other what the child had said. But he has nothing on at all, cried at last the whole people. That made a very deep impression upon the emperor, for it seemed to him that they were right. But he thought of himself. Now I must bear up to the end. And the chamberlains walked with still greater dignity, as if they carried the train that did not exist. So, <laughs> let it sink in for a bit. <clears throat> Trying to see what parts of the story you recognize. Your own life. And then turn to your neighbor and try. Uh, I'd like, you know each of you to share what this story tells you. Okay? In groups of two or three, just share what you just experienced. <laughs> So, I, I'm going to interrupt your conversations here. Um, I'm curious, uh, what did you recognize in this story? Do you want to share that? Recognize this a lot? In my life? No. No. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, it's difficult to speak up sometimes. Is that what you mean? Yeah. yeah. Okay. What else? Yeah. I think also the other way around. Uh, people don't have courage to, um, to admit their own mistakes, maybe, like the emperor. Yeah. So, close on, he sticks to his idea. Yeah. Keeping up appearances and yes, even at the end, huh? everyone knew he was naked, and then he said, "Actually, we'll just carry on till the end, just like nothing happened." Yeah. So it's very difficult to admit their own mistakes. What else did you recognize? Ah, <laughs> I could see some patterns from your talk earlier, right? <laughs> On the so, how how would you recognize that? How do you recognize that? So, uh, 
So um, agile is being commoditized to a point uh, that it becomes quite uh, the growth of the internet, yeah. and nobody dares to speak up. It's just a mindset, so we can't see it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just principles. I'm going to sell it to you. <laughs> I need more money. Yeah. Yeah? <laughs> exactly. So who has already been... Uh, no, I'm not going to ask this question, that's maybe a bit tough. But I'd like maybe for you to think for a bit. Maybe when there was a moment in your life when you were the first old minister that was sent out. You know, like the minister that's, hey, come and look at this cloth that no one can see, and that if you can not see it, you're stupid, and then tell me how it looks. Like, just think for a bit if you've ever had a moment like that. And again, maybe share just with your neighbor the experience that you had. So is there someone who would like to share one of the stories? Okay, with answering, I didn't understand that. 
I've worked at some point with people from India. I mean, it was my first, the first time I worked with an offshore team. And I was very surprised with the yes, yes gesture, which actually means that they're uncomfortable. They, I mean, there's this kind of respect. They won't, don't want to put you in a difficult position, so they will say yes, but actually they haven't understood. So it was on a complex software system that I wanted to explain. And did you understand it? Yes, yes, okay. <laughs> Um, and then, so I started turning it around and I said, okay, you know, I'm going to explain this to you and then I'll ask you to explain it back to me. So then I could like very subtly bridge the gaps. So really, I mean, this is something to keep in mind because we don't want to be in the position of the old minister. Imagine that being the first one sent out <laughs> to the guillotine. What else would you like to share from, from the stories you had? So I, I, was, uh, I was involved very early on when the Kanban training program was set up. And um, they were all very anti scrum <laughs> They said, ah, we don't certification. Ah, it's the worst thing. We don't want to do certification. We are going to do accreditation. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone is enthusiastic. Yes, yeah. we're going to do accreditation. And they're like, what's the difference? What's the difference? Don't you want to pick up? No. No. And then it's like a whole crowd. Oh, the magnificent close accreditation. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and it's, I mean, even in the story, the swindlers are very smart. They tell from the beginning, you know, the clothes we made. Stupid people can't see it, and people who are unfit for purpose cannot see them. So who would want to admit that they, that they can't see it? They just trick the people into that. And sometimes, without knowing it, we do it ourselves. Hey, I'm an agile coach, I'm gonna, you know, we're gonna work together on this agility thing. Okay, and you'll see improvement. How will I see it? Well, we don't know yet, it will depend on every team, you know? Some, sometimes I also get the impression that I'm selling, like that I'm one of the swindlers. Because when I come in and people ask, okay, shall we please tell me about this? Adult? Because we've heard it, our competitors are doing it, we want to do it as well. And you know, it's like the whole, we need to do it. Huh? And then I talk about mindset, and then it's like, okay, shall we? Uh, <laughs> is that okay? <laughs> you know, all these people pay me to come in and just like, do what? And, and it's, it's not easy. And when I was a software, okay, I have written my last piece of code eight years ago, so that doesn't make me as a software developer anymore. So I've put that aside. But sometimes when I came in into, a, into a new team, it was like, hey, what's your experience in this? Well, I, no, I've done a bit of C, C++, but I don't know these, um, uh, these frameworks, so not sure, do I qualify? Yeah? Am I a programmer or am I C a programmer? Can I do Java? I don't know. You know it's, when, do, when are we honest and truthful to ourselves and when are we just playing the swindlers? You know? Hey, look at that. So yeah, Maybe just like you thought on the uh, when were you ever maybe the old minister, I'd like you maybe to think for a bit on the times when you were, when you felt like the swindlers in the story. Not necessarily like wanting to do a bad thing, but just like trying to sell something that you thought wasn't there. Yep. Yeah, it's like uh, when I start, when I uh, began working, uh, I had some I had some experience from school, like a bit of uh, PHP. But, uh, my main work was for uh, to be a Java developer. But they asked for to put ev every experience inside your uh, CV. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, to 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 sell yourself to the customer, so you have more opportunities to. Uh, and uh, 
So after a while, after your experience, you just leave them out because your experience will be more into it than uh, yeah. skills. They ask for a few buzzwords because they know recruiters will look for these and uh, yeah. Uh, did it work out, uh, Kevin? Did, did it work out? Uh, <laughs> yes, it did. Uh, it's yeah, but it's true, huh? I mean, my first CVs, I had like Microsoft Word, Microsoft Excel. You know, <laughs> who, I mean, what's the point of adding these? And even today, sometimes ask me, do you have experience in Word and Excel because I don't see them on your CV? I say, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what, well, are we still 2019 here, or...? <laughs> yeah. What else? Uh, for me, perception is reality, and mm -hmm. a lot of people were really good at handling perception, and handling reality, and <laughs> along with that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, of course, perception is reality, like, if I tell you it's good on that, of course, they're there. <laughs> and then, as long as no, no one disagrees. <laughs> it's like a big elephant in the room thing, you know? <laughs> yeah. I think whoever does sales is very often what to do. Because you often want to sell something that you're still creating, or maybe you just thought of. Uh, you have to you know, be sure of yourself, try to sell it, and then think about how are you going to do this, or how yeah. will you find the right Yeah, because then it's okay, how am I going to do that? Okay, we've got mockers. <laughs> but, you know, and then the customer said, I've seen it. <laughs> you had the slides there, so I've seen it, it exists somewhere, perception is reality. So, so we need to be very careful with that. <clears throat> You know, you could maybe read in a story. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, really. Yeah. Did this thing, um, I, I did this by chance a few months ago at a Scrum Exchange in London. Um, I, it's kind of a conference where we like uh, open space at the start of the day, we just submit talks. And uh, on the Eurostar, I had just bought a book because I like stories and I like reading. And I, I read that and I said, the agile movement. And I, and I saw so many, so, I could make so many connections to what I'm seeing that I said, okay, I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm just going to read the story and see what happens. A bit like we're doing here. Um, and I, I mean, I think that we should spend more time on stories, not only user stories. You know, but also like stopping the time for it. And I really thank you all for having decided to come here. You, I don't know if you knew what to expect, but you know, we just have kind of stopped time for a bit and reflecting on how these stories, what they tell us, how what we can learn from them. At some point, I think during the swindlers reflection, I heard something like estimations. Yeah. <laughs> okay, no one speaks up. There's no, oh, when were you ever the little child? Of course, I'm always a little child, always pointing out the things. Of course, I'm never perfect. <laughs> or not? It's a tough one. I often uh, find uh, that, uh, uh, and uh, concept and things. Yes, I did not expect that. Come scarp in the hook. Because I have a different background, because I didn't grow up here, you just view things differently, and, in, and uh, because of that, I'm, I'm allowed to say that. Okay. And everyone else is not allowed to say that because. Uh, it's not done. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's the whole entourage of the opera. If they want to stay at the court, they need to be careful of what they say. Is that what you mean? Yeah. yeah. 
It's about also um, what were you saying, Patrick, about the cultural, about the company culture? It's a bit like that. At some point, there's things that you may say you can you can say, and if you don't say that, well, you might be an outsider, so you don't belong. That's also a tough one. Huh? If I speak up, I might be rejected. Hmm. Oh, well. But I really want that. No. Because I like my colleagues, I like my friends, I like, I like my situation. So, I'm fine. So, I know this is a different session. Um, well, we're moving towards the closure of this session. Uh, what I'd like is maybe just we'll get a few minutes of silence where you can like reflect what did hearing this story bring you, teach you? Okay, so for two minutes, just think what <coughs> it taught you. Enjoys moments of silence like that. Really, um, if anyone wants to share something about what they learned from the story, you don't have to. But if anyone wants to do so, Yes, yeah, so like instead of pointing it out. Uh, yeah, pointing it out and risking people not believing you or not yeah. wanting to see it because they're resisting it. Yeah. So it's about like instead of pointing it out and saying, oh, I see that, um, hoping that people will figure it out someday. Yeah, or maybe setting the scene so you would discover it. Yeah. This, this makes it then a bit more actionable when you say you're setting the seeds. So, like, and this is sometimes the things that ask from masters or like general coaches or whatever. You can just point the eyes towards a certain thing, like, oh, have you seen that? <laughs> no. But you think of the emperor. No? Doesn't he look like a little cobble there? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for, uh, it's about pointing out and uh, signaling something in an organization or, or whatever context. But for me, the most important thing is about uh, is, is is about admitting a mistake mm -hmm. in the other side from the from the emperor. I think uh, being the minister is sometimes necessary to achieve some goals, like in, in Kevin's uh, example. I think yeah, well, sometimes you have to do it, selling projects, uh, selling yourself. Uh, but in any case, uh, not being good came from it for the emperor, yeah? right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, and that's in a lot of contexts, like for example, also when you're, when you're uh, Active in the stock market as well. Eh? Sometimes people take take losses. Yeah. Much, I mean, losses are taken less than uh, profits. Eh? People yeah. take profits because you, one day it will grow. It will come yeah. up again. So right. and they keep being stubborn and doing the things. Yeah. Oh. I don't know if you've heard about the sunk cost fallacy. 
the same cost fallacy is the thing like it's it's what you explain. You know, if you see that your stocks go down and that and that, you say, well, you know, it will go up again. I've I bought them so much, so I can't afford to, and then you end up losing more. It's like you know, you've got this big multi-year project. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. You know, and then sometimes they slip. And they say, well, we're going to just invest more money on it. Then they still even more. And in the end, the cost of doing that is so much enormous gigantic that sometimes it's wiser to point out and say, hey, how much more money are we going to throw at it? It's exactly the same in a project, doing a project, yeah. I have the same principle when I wait on the phone. Yeah. Uh, and then I'm like, I'm not going to win that now, but I waited for so long. You're the 35th person on the line. <laughs> and sometimes also with bad movies. But then I guess there was a tipping point. <laughs> yeah, but you know, I've been to the theatre, I've been, I have watched some really bad movies till the end. Because I didn't want to leave. <laughs> Because I had paid for my ticket. Maybe, maybe it's going to get better at the end, but no, it didn't. <laughs> it's, I mean. <laughs> Sounds like bad relationships. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, exactly. <laughs> in life as well, relationship. I know some people who are in a bad relationship, but, you know, but shall we, you know, she's not out for all that bad. And she's also got some beautiful. Sorry, I'm saying, okay. Yeah. No, I'm not judging. <laughs> yeah. Any else? Any other closing points? Kids, uh, the kid could also whisper to me yeah. in the emperor's ear about yeah. the situation. Hey, my wife, hey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and now uh, he's so ashamed too because you know, now everyone knows a connection. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And he keeps his dignity yeah. by pretending to the end. Um, I wouldn't want to be in this space. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can have everyone be happy, but... <laughs> yeah, sure. He, he couldn't see the cloth. He was panicked, I think. Everyone else can see it, I can't. It's the same with doing a project, the manager that decided we have to do this project and it doesn't work out. Yeah. yeah. It's like you say, it, it will be a success someday. He throws money at it again and again. And exactly. Yeah, of course, it's my idea, it's clever, so of course it will work. <laughs> it's put more money at it, more people. Oh, we need more debt, we need more. Yeah. I, I, I've worked at so, some point. Um, well, it was uh, for the company that does all these term you know, and they were thinking of this great idea that we should maybe have some questions for the people, you know? Like, whenever they pay for something, we ask them a few questions and they could win prizes. And I say, okay, can you imagine people at the you know, end of the week when they're doing it, they're at Carrefour or at Colour or whatever, and then they have to pay, there's like 20 people behind them, and then there's three or four questions added in order to win something. You really believe you will do that? Yeah, of course. <laughs> but I mean, it was like, ah, no. Anyway, we're going in time. I think we're still good. But I will close it down. So, the thing I, I've gathered from all your feedback, this one thing here, is that I've got different. Um, stories coming out of the same story. So I mean, everyone had like different 
ways they could relate to the story or different parts of the story could, I mean, uh, resonate with them. Um, I use this as a metaphor as well when I work with teams. You know, we don't all have the same point of view and that's okay. <clears throat> so telling a story is great. And then, okay, you got the story, you got the message, yeah, right, okay, we'll move on. No, I think it's great to just stop for a bit. Hey, what did you get out of that? What did you get out of that? Hey, it's all different. Great, we can learn from it. Diversity creates better, more. So I, I truly believe that this is something we should nurture or do more with the people we work with. Stopping the time for a bit. Instead of doing a regular retrospective, let's just read the story. It changes sometimes. We don't need verses for that. And you know, sometimes just by changing a little bit, you can create more stuff. So I think the framework of what I did today, you can just take it back and reuse it with your teams. Just need a book, a story that's not too long. <laughs> uh, to take the whole book. Um, and, and then just start reflecting on it, stop the time. <clears throat> Thank you very much for your time. If you have any question, now's the time to ask them. Yes? Uh, it would be a, make a very good retro if you can simulate as much of those, but something. <laughs> Without <laughs> those. Don't. <laughs> 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 so you can add, uh, something is due. And see how they react. Obviously, it's not too old. Or use, think, yeah. it would be a very good data. Yeah. See what happens in the team. Exactly. See what happens. That's the beauty of it. Just do something and see what happens. Don't expect any specific outcomes. I didn't expect, expect anything special from me. I mean, anything specific from me. Because I knew you would tell me things and I would learn things from you. <laughs>